Uh, turn in your uh, notebooks to page 20, and we'll go ahead and start the PowerPoint. Men's Ministry That Works, training session number two. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, uh, last night we talked about what our target was. We said this is what we believe from the scripture is a biblical template for men's ministry. And now we're going to start on how do we get there? What's the process by which we go through to help build these building blocks into the lives of men? Men who would multiply these same building blocks into the lives of other men to the third and fourth generation. So Lord, would you just be with us now and teach us? And uh, help us to think through now from a process perspective how to make disciples to the third and fourth generation. So we commit this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, like I just said, last night we talked about what's our target? What's our end product? When we go through nine months of Every Man a Warrior, what is the end result? And we believe, hopefully, that if we do it correctly, that's our target. Men who will love God and walk with God for the rest of their life. Men who will be men of the word. Men of prayer. Men who will love their wives, train their children, manage money, fight to stay morally pure. Cling to Jesus in hard times. Go to God and do what's right when times get tough. And then have a passion to multiply these spiritual truths into the life of other men. Okay? That's our target. Making disciples is a process. If you're on page 21, making disciples is a process. Let's go to the next slide. Making disciples is a process. And so from here on out through the uh, conference, we're going to be talking about this process. Go next slide. This uh, process that we go through is in reality a two-year process. And so you can see from the, your uh, Materials there in front of you or on, on the uh, PowerPoint here. There are these individual building blocks. And down at the bottom in the yellow boxes or lightly brown boxes, you've got love God. Be a man of the word. Grow in prayer. Obedience and application. What book is that? Book one, you bet. That's the, the skills that we learn in book one that we will then apply through the rest of the process. But we know that if we shortchange this process by skipping over the skills, we will never effectively be able to get a man to the point where he needs to be. Yes. So this foundational building stone of walking with God and being a man of the word is key to the whole process. And we will start there. Now, to effectively, next, um, next slide. To effectively understand the process, we have to go and really educate ourselves in the whole issue of skills. Skills are the spiritual currency by which we leave a legacy to another person. I'm on page 22, if you're looking for me. Skills are the spiritual currency by which we pass on a legacy to another man. Let me give you an example. Next slide. We know that our first building block is to love God. That comes from the great commandment. So in book one, lesson two, we start helping man, men have a skill that will help them accomplish the objective. What's that skill? Having a quiet time. I can preach at you till I'm blue in the face. You need to love God more. You need to have a good love relationship with God. Grow in your love relationship with God. But in reality, that's not going to change you at all, is it? Me preaching at you. Sitting down with you and teaching you how to have a daily quiet time and then holding you accountable to do that week in and week out for the next nine months to a year until it is a new lifelong habit. And when you start spending time alone with Jesus as a new lifelong habit, guess what? God shows up. I joke with people that I have the easiest job in the world. That if I can just get a man to start spend time with Jesus, God does all the work. That's true, isn't it? So in this discipleship process, this is why in Every Man a Warrior, we spend so much time on helping men get the skills right 
as we heard Foster Brown on the radio, the ABCs of quiet time. You can't skip over this. These skills are what you ultimately are looking for in the men that you're discipling. When I come up to you and I say, tell me, how is your group going? What measurements do you use to evaluate whether your group is going well or not? Well, I'll tell you the ones that I'm looking for. I want to know whether or not your men are grasping how to have a daily quiet time. In fact, somewhere in book one, or usually by the beginning of book two, I want every man in my group to come to the group excited because he heard from the God of the universe in his quiet time. That's when I know I've done my job as a disciple maker. That's what I'm looking at. When I see the men in my group get excited about having a quiet time, when they can't wait to share what God showed them, I know we've done something. Now keep your finger here on page 22, and I want you to go back to the blue pages. And I'm going to pick on my friend Ben Gilmore, page 44, page 45. Ben, thank you for being so open and honest on this, because this will help men everywhere, because you're normal. You are normal. Because most of us, when we come to men and say, hey, we want to get you in this Bible study, and like Ben, Ben says, well, what's it about? Well, we're going to teach you how to have a quiet time. We're going to help you memorize verses. We're going to help you be in the Word. And Ben says it here so, so well in the second paragraph. He said, no... I hated scripture since it was always just memorizing words, disconnected to any study or experience that I hated so-called quiet times because I'm an American who loves multiphasic thinking. I felt I was unable to be alone with God more than the seconds of to say grace before a meal. Many men feel that way. Many men have been told a hundred times that they should be a better man spiritually. And they've tried to become a better man spiritually, and since no one showed them how, they got frustrated. In fact, they began to dislike it. Now, Ben talks about his group here, and flip over. Well, on the bottom of page 44, in the dark words, I put effort, extra emphasis on this. And then it happened. Flip over. I got to the point where I got to have my quiet time with God. I got to memorize scripture in the context of a lesson and a principle that we discussed and learned. I got to dissect, dissect a Bible verse and ask questions that brought the word to life. I got to know God better. And sometimes I got lost in my quiet time. I was so moved by his word. This is what I'm looking for as a leader of an Everyman Warrior group. And it usually starts to happen about the middle of book one. And, you know, you want to keep encouraging men. In fact, I think you could take Ben's testimony about the middle of book one and say, men, let me just read a story from a guy who, you know, really struggled with quiet time and how God changed his whole perspective on quiet time through Everyman Warrior. Men, are some of you having quiet times like this yet? Now, you as the leader should have quiet times like this. Whether you know it or not, you are modeling what your men are going to shoot for. This is why when we first get a group started and nobody's been through it, sometimes it gets messy. But like on the second and third year when we've got experienced leaders who have already been through the materials, they need to model for their group what it means to have a quiet time and the things that they're getting from their quiet time and what God is teaching them. And pretty soon the men in your group will pick up on it. They'll go, oh, okay. And what's exciting is when your men start to hear from God. Okay? Go back to page 22. So everyone, I hope you write this down, every one of the building blocks of discipleship has a skill tied to it. Did you know that? Every one of the building blocks of discipleship has a skill tied to it. Let's go to page 23. The second building block in our 
discipleship model is for you and I to become men of the word. Men of the word. Now, what's the skill? There's a couple different ones, but what are the skills that we do in Every Man a Warrior to help you become a man of the word? Come on, yell it out. Memorization. Scripture memorization and meditation. You bet. Scripture memory and meditation. Now, Ben said in his testimony where he got so excited about meditating on the verse when it was in the context of a story. It was in the context of a real man dealing with a real life issue. And somewhere in this process, usually about book two, is when the light goes on for men because they're meditating on verses that have to do with marriage and raising children. Now, hopefully, it's gone on before then. Now, many men, when they memorize Philippians 4, 6, and 7 on prayer, or another verse in the first book, and they all of a sudden, they find themselves recalling that verse when they're talking to another man. And they go, wow, this is really cool. That man was sharing his, his problem with me, and I had a verse for him. But especially when we get to book two, the light has to go on to, for men. These verses that we are memorizing are not just fluff. These are verses that will help change the direction of your life. And the purpose of memorizing the word is that you and I can apply it to our own life and pass it on to another man. I hope you write that one down. The purpose of memorizing the verse that are in every man a warrior is so that you can apply it to your own life and then be prepared to pass it on to another man. I asked this question last night. How many of you had sons? A bunch of you raised your hand. I said, how many of you want your sons to fail? Every hand went down. Well, who's going to teach your sons principles from the scripture on money, marriage, raising children, sex, moral purity, work going through our times? You can. You can. Now, all of you probably know Joshua 1.8, but let's just turn to it in our Bibles. It's also on the next slide. Joshua 1.8. You can probably just look up here. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you'll be prosperous and successful. Now, I, this is a little bit of a trick question. Why do we meditate on the verses? Why do we meditate on the verses? Adam knows the answer. Why do you meditate on the verses? In order to obey. In order to obey. In order to do it. I've asked that many times at church men's conferences, and men will yell out, so I can prosper and succeed in life. <laughs> well, we all want that, but you can't miss the most crucial step. The most crucial step in being a man of the word is that you meditate on it so that you can do it. You can put it into practice. You can have Ephesians 5.25, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave up his life for her, but until you begin to put it into practice so that your wife sees it, your marriage is not going to change. Is that right? That's right. You can know Proverbs 22, 7, the ritual over the poor and the borrower becomes a slave of the lender. But until you change your attitude about borrowed money, you're probably going to stay in bondage, aren't you? Yes. You've got to work at getting out of debt. Now, the process here is kind of shown in this illustration. We meditate on the word. Our key objective is to do it. And then by faith, what happens? When we put it into practice, we begin to see God's success. How many of you, when you understood what your wife's love language was, and you began to love her according to her love language, saw something positive happen in your marriage? We had a three-star general out at the Army War College in Car Carlisle, Pennsylvania. He was a three-star general. He had a PhD from MIT. And when he got, came to Christ at age 53, and a year and a half later got in Every Man a Warrior, and he began to memorize the word. 
A year goes by, and he continues to memorize verse, uh, the verses, new verses. He had over 200 verses memorized, and he was leading every man a warrior with a group of generals at the Pentagon. But he's meditating on 1 Peter 3, 7. He shared this testimony to a group of army brass. Now, he's a three-star general, and he was above all of them, but he could actually humble himself and share this. He said, men, I, before I came to Christ, I was not the husband God wanted me to be. I knew it. My wife knew it. I started memorizing 1 Peter 3, 7, and as I began to meditate on it, husbands, live with your wife in an understanding way. And through every man a warrior, I began to realize that we were supposed to figure out our wife's love language. And I realized that my wife's love language were words of affirmation. And so as I prayed this through, I began to think, what kind of words of affirmation should I say to my wife? And what he did was he began to write sticky notes and put them on his wife's mirror because she, he goes to work really early. He knows that she sleeps in. She gets up and the first thing that she sees when she goes into the bathroom is a sticky note from her husband that says, honey, I love you and you're the best thing that's ever happened to me. Honey, thank you for staying with me during the years when I was not the man or the husband that I should have been. Honey, you make me a better man. And I asked him privately how his wife responds to this. His wife of 35 years, so she's probably in her mid-50s, he says, oh, Lonnie, she giggles. She giggles. My wife of 35 years giggles when she sees sticky notes because I found out that her love language were words of affirmation and I just write a little sticky note telling her how I feel. Do you think their marriage has improved? It's gone through the roof. Her love for him, in fact, one of the reasons he kept doing Bible studies with other generals is that his wife goes and tells every other woman how special her husband has become since he's done Every Man a Warrior. Because he meditated on a verse and he put it into practice, his marriage had prosperity and success. Now, what would happen? Next slide. I want to ask you a question. Bottom of page 23. What might happen if a Christian man memorized and meditated on five verses and then he discussed those five verses with other Christian men and together as they discussed and wrestled with those verses, they worked at putting them into practice. And what if he memorized five verses, discussed them with other men, put them into practice in the areas of money, marriage, raising children, work, sex, and hard times? What might happen? They may spur one another on. You bet. That's what Next slide. Next slide. That's, what I'm That's right. He might begin to succeed in life. They might just begin to succeed in life. Do you, do you get this? We took Joshua 1.8 and we applied the principle of Joshua 1.8 to each one of the building blocks that we got from 1 Timothy 3 and Titus chapter 1. And in the process, we're talking about process now. We're looking at the second leg. This is books two and three. This is what we're shooting for in books two and three. Helping men to take the skill that they learned in book one, to meditate on the scripture, to apply it, to put it into practice. And for the next two books, book two and three, we help them take these verses, figure out how to put them into practice, and thereby become the husband and the father God would want them to be. They change the way they manage money. They begin to fight to stay morally pure. They go to work with a different perspective because they know that they're there because God has called them to be a witness in that place. Wouldn't this be wonderful? If we would raise up an army of men who knew five verses on money, five verses on marriage, five verses on raising children, five verses on sex and moral purity, five verses in work, and we've helped them put them into practice? 
It is wonderful. Yeah. How many of you have already experienced it? Yeah. Okay. This is where we're going. Helping men succeed in life. Okay. The next slide. Now, this is the discipleship process we saw on the bottom there. We've got the uh, building blocks from verse from book one. In uh, the goal, uh, the purple boxes, those are building blocks from book two and three. Remember, we said that there is a skill associated with every building block. Some of the skills are easy to see; other of the skills are a little harder. But for book two, the skill of knowing your wife's love language is a tremendous skill. Dealing with your selfishness, that's a skill we try to help men grasp. Seeing your wife's differences as a gift from God rather than something to argue over. But especially understanding her wife, your wife's love language. Husbands live with your wife in an understanding way and treat her with honor. Now, what's the skill in raising children? What is it? Listening. listening would be one, but we have you do for seven weeks. We take one of your children and we do what? Take them on a date. One-on-one on one time with your children. Now, in that is the skill that we do. Make it safe. Learn to ask questions. Shut up and listen. Make it mostly about the child. Pray with them. Speak a building block of truth into their life. I was having breakfast this morning with this man right down here. He told me this story. He said, I have a wonderful relationship with my 19-year-old son. So when I got to book two, I thought, man, we already have a great relationship. I don't know. And he started doing father-son time. And he started to take his son out. His son's in college. They met near the university. He started to ask his son questions. He started to listen. He started to uh, make it safe. I think he was already doing a good job of that. He began to pray with his son. Then he finds out later that after a few weeks of this, every time he meets with his son, his son immediately begins to text his girlfriend, I just had time with my dad and it was amazing. Children get their self-image from what they believe dad thinks about them. And when you and I choose to go after and pursue our children in order to spend time with them, and we have a goal in mind, we're going to try and make it safe. We're going to try and figure out where our kids are at. We're going to ask questions. We're going to make it mostly about them. We're going to shut up and listen. We're going to pray with them. And then here's the big one. As God gives opportunity, we're going to speak a building block of truth into their life. Now, where do you get the building blocks of truth that you want to speak into your children's lives? From your quiet time. That's why book one is so important. In your walk with God, as you get time in the Word, and as you're praying for your children, guess what? God will give you verses that are specific needs that your children have. But you're going to know truth on money and marriage and raising children and other things as well. And as you begin to memorize these verses, these truths will be truths that you want to pass on to your sons and daughters. And in their God-given design, they always long to have a deeper and greater understanding of how God loves them. But they want that relationship with dads. And you can help move them at every stage of life into greater wisdom, greater understanding. My daughters consistently call me all the time. The questions are just different now. They're 27, 28, and 26. The questions are just different now. But we've been doing father-daughter time since they were three and five. My children are so much farther along than I was at that age because... Starting in high school, we talked about God stuff all the time. And verses that I had memorized for years just came out in our conversations. Now, two of my daughters are in full-time ministry, and so they're asking me all these questions about ministry stuff. Guess what? I've got 37 years of experience, and so I get to pass it on. But every one of you has life experience that you can pass on to your children. Sometimes that life experience is how we did it wrong. And that's okay. 
I know a number of men who, with their adult sons, young adult sons or daughters, when they're asked a personal question about a certain issue about that stage of life, the men say, honey or son, uh, I did that one wrongly. I didn't know Christ back then, or I didn't know the truth of the scripture back then, and I really messed that one up. But let me tell you what I wished I would have done. And here's how God has given me some wisdom and insight into that issue right now. And you can share a verse. Now, let me tell you a secret. I shared this this morning. When you learn to do father-son or father-daughter time, and the skill is to make it safe, learn to ask questions, shut up and listen, make it mostly about them, pray with them, and speak a building block of truth. Do you know what? Those are the exact same skills you need to be successful to disciple another man. Did you get that? Those are the exact same skills you need to disciple another man. So, you can do it one way or the other. You can learn on your kids, or you can learn other than men, and then do it better with your kids, but either way, the skill set is the same. So, men, what we do here in this discipleship process has multiple applications. It's not just about ministering to other men. So, when you do father-son, daughter time, you're already improving your skills at being effective at ministering to another man. Okay, we're going to have to hurry up here. Let's do the next slide. The Great Commission. The third leg of our illustration there is the Great Commission. And this is what we do during year two. Year two is when we help men successfully multiply the truths of every man a warrior into the life of a man that, another man. Now, Matthew 28, next slide. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, I'm on page 25 now, gives us a definition for go and make disciples. All authority in heaven and on earth has been, going, been given to me. Therefore, I get to tell you whatever I want to tell you, Jesus said. And here's the most important thing I got to tell you. Go and make disciples. And then I believe he gave us a definition for what that is. Teaching them to do everything I taught you. Now, let's just break this down. Jesus spent three years with his disciples. And during those three years, he was teaching them spiritual truths, right? And now at the end of his life, he says, I want you to take those spiritual truths and pass them on to another man. Is that right? Okay, what about 2,000 years? Fast forward 2,000 years. You and I spend time with Jesus. And when you and I are spending time with Jesus in the word and prayer, does he teach us spiritual truth? When you start memorizing verses, does he teach you spiritual truth? If you get all 24 of the Every Man a Warrior verses memorized, will you have at least 24 spiritual truths? And now, I want you to go and pass those spiritual truths on to another man. It's no different now than it was 2,000 years ago. We start by spending time alone with Jesus. Once again, this is why our quiet time is so important. This is why the foundational building stone of what we do is the great commandment. Spending time with Jesus is where we learn spiritual truth. And ultimately, we're given the task of passing that spiritual truth on to another man. Next slide. I guess I put it out here. Jesus spent time with the disciples, taught them spiritual truth. He said, pass it on. We spend time with Jesus. He teaches us spiritual truth. We go through every man a warrior. We get time in the word. We memorize verses. He teaches us spiritual truth. And what do we do now? In year two, we begin to learn the skill of passing these spiritual truths on to another man. Now, there's this hidden thing in every man a warrior. In book one, you start sharing your quiet time, don't you? Do you know what you're learning to do? You're learning to pass a spiritual truth that you got from your quiet time on to another man. We are already teaching you the skill of discipleship, of passing spiritual truth on to another man. That's why when groups don't do quiet time, it doesn't work. 
That's why when groups, you know, have rabbit trailitis, like Tony talked about, instead of sharing their quiet time in a way where you share the spiritual truth, the best verse, the best thought, the key thought, how I'm going to put it into practice. And so as you teach men this, you're basically setting them, set them up to pass spiritual truth onto their children, grandchildren, and other men to go make disciples. Okay, next slide. Now you have this. In fact, this is on page um, 26. Uh, actually, I think, let's see here. Okay, yeah, uh, four to seven men. We've learned that that tends to be the best size group. Meet every week for 90 minutes at least. Try and get through the whole lesson each week. I have found some groups that lollygag. And it's normally because they uh, have done this with other Bible studies. They've been meeting for five years, and since there's no real end target in mind, they just, take as, they just go as slow as they want. And so I know some groups that take a whole year to get through book one. That does not work. We need to go a little bit farther, a little bit faster, a little bit deeper. We're not just doing a discussion group here. We're going deep in the lives of men where we actually build skills into their lives. So try and finish the whole lesson every week, except in book two. Book two, it's okay to take two weeks on every lesson. The lessons on uh, marriage and raising children are extra long, and we really want to go deep in these. Okay? Follow the leader's guide. Follow the leader's guide. How many of you led a group where you didn't follow the leader's guide and you got lost? Yeah. Yeah, nobody wants to admit it, but I've heard hundreds of stories on that. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Um, hundreds of stories where guys said, yeah, we didn't follow the leader's guide and we got lost. And then the next year we followed the leader's guide and it went much better. Literally, fellas, there were hundreds of hours of research going into the leader's guide. And I really believe that we took about 60 years of navigator discipleship experience to make the leader's guide most effective. Or on a more joking way to say it, I've already made all the mistakes you can make in discipleship, and I wrote those out of the leader's guide. Yeah. So you don't have to do it. We can help men have successful marriages, walk with God, and have good relationships with their children. Every Man a Warrior is a discipleship process where we help men learn how to walk with God love their wives, train their children, manage money, fight to stay morally pure, cling to Jesus in hard times, and then develop a passion to multiply to the third and fourth generation. Okay? We're out of time. Let me close in prayer. Lord, thank you for this time. I pray that in this group there would be a whole army of men who become expert builders, expert disciple makers. Men who begin to grasp the process of making a disciple. Men who understand the value of skills and how building a skill into a life will change that life forever. Lord, thank you for this time now, and we pray in Jesus' name.